Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our noonday prayers. I want to make one announcement before we start, which is that next Wednesday, we will be gathering here in Little St. Mary's in person. Um, in a limited number, you'll need to register in an email, including a link to register, um, will go out this coming Monday. Um, but I'm very excited for that and um, so looking forward. Hmm? Continue to and we will continue to live stream. Thank you, Ashley. Our order of worship begins on page 103 in the Book of Common Prayer. <clears throat> O oh God, make speed to save us. O oh Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Our psalm for today is Psalm 139, verses 1 through 9, and that is on page... 794 in the prayer book. Psalm 139, verses 1 through 9. Lord, you have searched me out and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You trace my journeys and my resting places and are acquainted with all my ways. Indeed, there is not a word on my lips, but you know, O Lord, it all together. You press upon me behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain to it. Where can I go then from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I climb up to heaven, you are there. If I make the grave my bed, you are there also. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand hold me fast. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. This is a reading from the Gospel according to Matthew. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you, that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Thanks be to God. In the cycle of feasts and fasts of the church year, today is a day when we remember Anselm of Canterbury, who lived from 1033, when he was born in Italy, till he died on this day, April 21st, in 1109. And we remember Anselm chiefly uh, for his theological work and its profound influence in the church over the centuries. Anselm lived and worked at the cusp of, enorm of an enormous sea change in the trajectory of the Western world. 
the world, at least in the West, was moving from the high Middle Ages into a time that we came to call modernity. It's a change that took centuries, really, but Anselm stood there right at the beginning, along with Thomas Aquinas, and set the stage for what was to come. And what I want to principally remember Anselm for is his work to see faith and reason as not antagonistic, but mutually complementary. A century after Anselm, Thomas said that grace perfects reason. This idea that faith and reason are complementary is included in one of Anselm's most uh, famous dictums or teachings. He said, credo et intelligum, which means, I believe in order that I may understand. In other words, the great story of God that we come from love, which is why we are here, that we live by and are nourished by love, as surely as we are by food and water and air, that we are meant to give and receive love, that is our purpose, and that we are bound for love, that is our destiny, shapes the whole structure of how God tells us who we are and whose we are in God's Word in the Bible. Belief in God's great story shapes our understanding of this world and the lives that we live day by day. God's story gives our lives purpose and meaning. God's story shows us how to make sense of all of our many stories. So, Anselm urges, we believe in order that we may understand. And I was thinking about just this last night. Yesterday, a jury in Minneapolis reached a conclusion in its deliberations in the trial of Derek Chauvin, a former Minneapolis police officer who had been charged in the death of George Floyd last May. And the jury found Chauvin guilty on all three charges. And last night, as I was thinking about the day and the outcome of the jury's deliberations, I found myself wondering if this trial and its outcome would become spoken of in the same way that we speak about other significant landmark cases like Brown versus Board of Education or the Dreyfus Affair or the infamous Dred Scott ruling. I wondered if it would be a case where in the days and years to come, it will be recognized that in this case, we saw the tectonic plates of our history, the good of it and the bad of it, and that those tectonic plates have collided in this case and brought clearly into view long unresolved conflict and rendered a judgment about that conflict. Mostly, I think we live day by day. Mostly, we live our days close at hand. Walk the dog, go to work, finish a report, buy groceries, go to bed. Mostly, our perspective is occupied with the story of a day. Oh no, what are we going to have for dinner? Why does my big toe hurt today? Shall I color my hair? But there are moments that show us that we are a part of a larger, greater story. I wonder, is this trial one of those moments with the potential to clarify who we are and who we hope to be?
Is it an opportunity to see ourselves as a part of a greater, larger story? At stake in this case in our lives is, at least, what we mean by the word justice. It is undoubtedly a foundation stone of our nation. And justice is also one of the great themes of the Bible and one of the attributes that we ascribe to the very nature of God. God in God's self is just. One of the most compelling definitions of justice I've ever run into is one by Dr. Cornell West when he said, justice is what love looks like in public. I think Dr. West borrowed this thinking from Paul Tillich, who probably borrowed it from Aristotle, but neither Aristotle nor Tillich ever put it quite so beautifully. Justice is what love looks like in public. And what does God say love looks like in public? Well, here is an example from the book of Deuteronomy. Please bear with me for just a second. If there is among you anyone in need, a member of your community in any of your towns within the land that the Lord your God has given you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward your needy neighbor. You should rather open your hand, willingly lending enough to meet their need, whatever it may be. Be careful that you do not entertain a mean thought, thinking, the seventh year, the year of remission, is near, and therefore view your needy neighbor with hostility and give nothing. Your neighbor might cry to the Lord against you, and you would incur guilt. Give liberally and be ungrudging when you do so. For on this account the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all that you undertake. Since there will never cease to be some in need on the earth, I therefore command you, open your hand to the poor and needy neighbor in your land. Justice is what love looks like in our public life. Sometimes we live day by day, step by step, and sometimes we run into moments where we know that we belong to a larger story, God's story. And I wonder if this is such a moment now. How does our faith give us understanding about who we are and how we shall live and what we shall live for? Our great brother in the faith, Anselm, lived in such a time and has given us gifts to use. How shall the faith that is in us, faith in Jesus, whose life is given with love to heal and redeem this sinful and broken world, call us to understand the moment we live in? Remember, we come from the holy love of God. We live by that same love, and we are bound for that love. This is a moment to recall this, this larger story, God's great story that we are a part of, and to show us how to understand where we stand in this moment and what we are called to do. Amen. We continue our prayers on page 106. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
Lord, hear our prayer and let our cry come to you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you raised up your servant Anselm to teach the church of his day to understand its faith in your eternal being, perfect justice, and saving mercy. Provide your church in every age with devout and learned scholars and teachers, that we may be able to give a reason for the hope that is in us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. I invite your prayers of thanksgiving or intercession. I give you thanks, Lord, for this beautiful day and for the promise of the changing of seasons that are all about us in this world. We pray for the changing of the seasons of our lives through the power and grace of your Holy Spirit. the love that you hold us with is the love we do in public. I pray for grace for all of us to continue to persevere in this time when we are almost there but not there. Give us wisdom to offer grace to one another. Pray for Mike Blanks as he recovers from surgery. We pray for Margot Rose, who will be baptized May the 2nd. We pray for all of our confirmands as they approach the confirmation of their faith in them at the bishop's visit on May 9th. We pray for Emily Brooke during this time of transition. And we pray for the Ministry of Discernment to discern a call to that ministry in the coming months. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, peace, peace I give to you, my own peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church, and give to us the peace and unity of that heavenly city, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign, now and forever. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless, preserve, and keep you this day and forevermore. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. God bless you all. <laughs>